Hey everyone, it's Classic DM. Uh, tonight's episode from Season 2 is going to be called The Horn. Now earlier today we did a little drawing session. We drew all our maps for the episode and we'll try to get through a few of these spaces, but the fights get long, we may not be able to. So we're going to try to do something also a little different here. I'm going to do a quick little sound check for about a minute. Um, there is a YouTube channel you got to check out. It's called Sword Coast Soundscapes. I really like it because basically what they have put together is a series of uh, ambient looping uh, audio tracks that just go forever and ever. And I'm trying to mix the sound level so you can hear those in the background and he still hear me talk without me being too loud. Um, so we're doing this kind of ghetto style. So give me 30 seconds because I'm going to listen to this on a laptop make sure the background sound nice for this catacomb sound. And be sure to look at the description as well. You can check out their YouTube channel. I like to give people credit, and that's what they've asked for, and they certainly deserve it because it takes a lot of time and energy to make these things. So hang on just a minute, and I'll be right back. That's not too loud. I'm going to do another quick check for about 20 seconds here. I'm in the yellow on the uh, background sound, but it doesn't sound too loud when I'm listening to it on another PC to stream. Once we get this little audio check done, we're going to kick right into the action. we got our party, as you can see on the screen to the left here, um, set up camp in the former White Dragon Cavern. So give me another 20 seconds here, and then we'll be able to get rolling because we've got some cool surprises for you tonight, too. I think that sounds pretty cool. All right, great. Let's not screw around anymore, right? You ready to go kill some stuff? That's great. So let's do this. One of the first things we've done since last episode is we've uh, got ourselves some minis. Went to the Dragon's Lair here in San Antonio. And uh, I told about the show, but they didn't give a damn. <laughs> and so what we've done is we've replaced everyone. Here's Zolaris. We've replaced everyone with a miniature. Now, I don't have the camera super zoomed in. Let's go in a little bit closer. Eventually, I'm going to get another camera. Um, the, the second camera allowed me to... Uh, give you a sense of what some of these guys look like and I haven't painted many since I was 13 so my paint jobs aren't that awesome. This is Obscura and then we've got one here for uh, uh, Elephanisi, a monk character and then we've got the druid character back here in the back and this is one for Mercedes, a little two-handed plate mail wearer and here's one for Antola, our cleric with a shield and this is one for Varenjar. Um, so one of the problems I'm having is, uh, you know, I'm using the audio from the YouTube channel for Sword Coast Soundscapes in the background, but I may have my bitrate jacked up a little high because I'm getting a couple of hitches every now and then. If it gets really nasty, because I know it's the longer you stream something, the worse it gets. So we're going to keep rolling the tape here and see how it goes, and if it gets bad, we'll, uh, we'll cut the audio in the background, but I think it'd be neat to try that. Let's get on with the action. So Last time our party, this is the, uh, the former White Dragon Cave that you may remember a few episodes ago. This is a massive treasure pile here that they looted a couple things from, nothing too, too critical. They had cleared the room beyond this, which is to this way here, to the west. They set up camp, recovered all their spells, especially the cleric who had to use a couple of heals in the last big battle. Everyone's rested up. The druid's rested up. She's got her shapeshift back. Obscura's got her spells back. So they're ready to go move forward. So. They did have some reinforcements come, and I'm going to switch the maps while I keep talking uh, when we move to the next room. They did have some reinforcements come. It was a really nasty battle. It was called the, the Great Entry Hall or something along those lines. I can't remember exactly what I called it. But the uh, um, they uh, they made their way through it pretty well. And let's also get this cleared off real quick. I'm going to go grab the other map, and I'll be right back.
Okay, so what we're going to do here to make it really simple and not spend a lot of time map transitioning is I'm just going to put this map on the screen because we're not going to be in here long. And basically what happens is you've got here from the uh, this side over here. So Varinjar and Elephantisa, you're going to go first. No one's hidden in shadows or anything. Then we have Zollers and Mercedes. And then following up the rear is the Druid and then the Cleric and then Obscure in the back. So they go move this boulder out of the way and they're going to work their way this way. On the Patreon site, we allowed everyone to vote as to where to go next. There was one option to go north. One was to go south, one was to go over this way to the west. Everyone voted, of the few people that voted, that is, decided to go west. But the way we're going to handle this is we're going to have Mercedes come here and Zoller's going to come here. Elephanisi is going to hide in shadows back over here in the corner. And Varinjar is just going to come here and push this boulder out of the way. Now remember, let's get his sheet up for you real quick. Varinjar has the girdle of uh, fire giant strength. You can see it here is in his character sheet on the right hand side. That was a loot drop from a while back. Uh, and uh, this thing gives him an incredible 7,500 pound lift weight and also his bin bars gift uh bin bars lift gates number gets really sky high so these boulders are being used by the frost giants as doors so for him to roll the door out of the way basically the um boulder out of the way isn't really a problem so the cleric will get here obscure will get here there's corpses there on the ground nothing's been moved it's only been about eight hours nothing seems to have come in the room there's no wandering monsters to deal with but let's just get a quick roll for him and the roll is really going to cover you know it's not like he can't succeed at this he can do it easily the roll is to see if he can do it quietly okay it's not really a move silently check or anything like that but we're just going to do his roll as we roll 88 or less um everything and 80 percent or less he's going to be able to do it relatively quietly like open a door very smoothly and quietly okay so that's a zero zero and a five okay that's a zero zero five that's perfect roll so he's going to roll this boulder um, over to get the side of it and then he's going to roll it into the room so now we're going to switch to the next room properly and then we'll take it from there okay and i want to work i knew we weren't going to be on this map for very long so i didn't want to do the real switch the formal switch until we uh got everything really out of the way let's get this tape off of here i guess one thing that could be happening is uh with this looping ambient track in the background is that the um, when the when the person that made it, when there is a loop where it resets the sound file like that, it could be a bandwidth issue. Um, maybe it's popping a little bit. I really pushed the boundaries of my bandwidth, so I hope that's not causing a huge issue. But like I said, if it gets worse, I'll uh, I'll turn it off. Let me get this down here so you can see it real nicely, and I'm going to readjust the map to not have as much uh, wasted space in the background. Let's get a little tape here and get this tape down because we're going to have a nasty little fight in this room, that's for sure. Let's put this like this. Let me get this taped down. We drew this today. We did a little video that walked through how we do these drawings. So, whoops, I got turned the wrong way. That's not a very good idea. Let's do this. North is always up for you. We're going to rotate this and turn it for you. Sorry, I don't know what I was thinking. I think I turned it the way that I drew it. There we go. Get that all the way down here so you can see it good. And this is going to go about right here. And then let's put this down at this end. Alright. Sorry for the delay. Okay, north is to the top for you. So essentially what happens is Varinjar pushes this boulder, and the boulder is going to be rolling out of the way. And like you may notice in some of the other. Uh, maps that we've done the um we're gonna pull the camera in a little closer for you too let's get this room up here a little bit better so you can see it better so we can make it big so put this up here let's slide this like this you can see the room a little bit better let's go a little bit closer you don't need this junk on the side all right We'll be in here for a little bit, so it's worthwhile getting in the whole uh, room in the frame. This is the bottom of the frame here, so it's going to pull this up. So let's get this down. And we'll pull this up here. There we go. Creepy soundscape. Alright. Alright, now we're in business. So, back to gameplay. When this boulder rolls in the room, it just rolls a little bit, rolls to about here, okay? So this one that's here is not here anymore, so here's your boulder, and it kind of comes to a stop. Now, the first thing that 
The problem is that they've rolled this boulder to this room where there's a frost giant sitting here, there's another frost giant sitting here, and there's another one over here messing with this table. So there's three frost giants in the room. And when he rolls this boulder, this one kind of looks up over the table, and this one kind of turns over his left shoulder and looks into, at him and is like, what the devil's going on? That's a, an immediate surprise check, okay? Because the door opening and closing there isn't that big of a deal for them, but it closing, opening and closing right now, when they didn't hear anyone talking or shuffling around the hallway, is kind of weird. So we're going to roll for surprise here. This isn't an initiative roll. This is a surprise roll. Whoever wins is uh, not surprised, okay? So the bad guys roll. Let's get this on screen. That's a 6 and a 4 is 10, plus 6 is 16. That's the bad guy's roll. That's a really good roll for them. And 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 for Vrinjar, so he's not going to win that roll. So he wasn't hidden in shadows because he's doing an action. Even if he was hidden in shadows, he would, become, he would be revealed. So when this boulder pushes to the... He pushes it, rolls to a stop here. He's flat-footed, standing in the doorway. This guy jumps up out of his chair and gets ready to engage. And he comes around the chair this way, and this guy runs over here to this horn. Now, this is a huge, massive... Uh, carved horn out of stone and it says that the whole thing has been made out of stone and carved and hollowed out it's not a bone horn like it's not a dragon horn but it's made of a uh, stone with a little bit of metal reinforcement and stuff like that so it's used as kind of like an alarm but what we're going to do here is since seeing a human in the doorway and he can't really see the other characters very well yet isn't necessarily cause for alarm when there's three frost giants so we're going to roll for initiative start the combat this guy's by the horn, but I'm going to say that he's not going to try to go blow the horn. If he blows his horn, it's like a huge, massive, bugling horn you'd see in Sweden or something. I forgot what their proper name for those things is. It would be an alarm, so the whole back area of the whole dungeon would be alarmed and things might come running to help because no one blows his horn very often. All right, you ready to do some combat? Let's do an initiative roll. Since Varinjar is by himself, he's going to get his dexterity bonus, which gives him plus two to his initiative die roll. We'll try to keep this on screen. So we're just going to do the initiative roll for all three frost giants. So there is a two. Let's actually use a pin for this, make it much easier. Uh, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's a seven for him. And let's do Vrinjar's roll. So five, six, seven. But his bonus is going to get him just enough to beat that, a nine. So he gets to go first. What he's going to do immediately is he's going to um, take one, two, let's see, one, two, three steps to here. And I'm going to give this Frost Giant an opportunity to come here and take a swing at him, but it's not of attack of opportunity because he won the initiative. So he wasn't in range to be struck. And then now we can have the other character step into the room. So the next thing that's going to happen is we have Mercedes and Zolaris. So Mercedes comes from this way and Zolaris come into the room. And behind them is Elephanisi. Now Elephanisi is going to try to hide in shadows. Let's get her sheet up real quick so you can see what her numbers are. Um, she would have hidden in shadows and moved silently before the door opened. So she needs two percentile rolls. So her um, hide in shadows is 68%. Let's do that first. That's a 73. She thinks she's hidden in shadows, but she's not. Um, moving, if something's not looking at her, they may not detect her. Um, her move silently is 83. Let's see if she can get an 83 off. That's an 84, so she fails both of those. But the way I run that is, you don't realize it. You think that you're concealed, but you're not. So she's going to move into the room behind and try to slip behind this boulder. Now, another thing we always want to take in consideration is fire. So we have this smoke coming up here, going up to this 40-foot tall cavern. This cavern is really tall, so smoke billowing up here and going up to the top. I noticed that when I move my hand on the camera, the updates make the uh, audio pop a little bit. That's kind of weird. We have a torch burning here. We have a little torch burning here, a little torch blowing here. So it's a very well illuminated room. There's a torch burning right here. And we even got one right here that's right underneath where Mercedes is burning. So, Renjar won the initiative. Everyone else has used their initiative to move. Now we actually have combat. So this first frost giant is going to attack this one. This guy's going to move here. This one's going to move here. These two are intent on trying to attack these two. So the first thing we're going to do is combat between Varinjar and the Frost Giant directly in front of him. So I, I pre-do some sheets for these kids. So this is a Frost Giant stats right here. To take a quick look at it, let me put it a little bit here on the screen so you can see it better. Um, so you're talking about uh, hit dice eight, 10, AC 4. Uh, these guys only need a 10 to hit AC 0. I got a little hit point sheet here for everyone's hit points. I'll keep that off to the side just in case. I'll track it. And I got hit points for the uh, Frost Giants as well. But to keep all this gibberish off the screen, um, this guy is going to engage with... Uh, he's going to go for uh, Varinjar first. So 
because we won initiative and Varunjar chose to move, for the other Frost Giant to take two big steps and just try to step forward doesn't really mean that he's going to uh, lose initiative. So he's going to get that first attack. So he leans that they need a 10 to hit AC0. That means they need a 12 to hit Varunjar. Okay, so here's our die roll. So a 9, he actually misses. So Varunjar is able to retaliate. I'm going to have him do that after we see what happens with these two. Um, remember, these are five foot diameter characters. This is a two handed sword Mercedes and then Zollers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Zollers and Mercedes both side by side hold the line kind of a situation, meaning that this Frost Giant can't get to them. So this Frost Giant is going to attack the two of them. I'm going to have them randomly choose who they're going to pick. One to three will be go for Zollers. Four, five, and six will be Mercedes. So one to three, they've chosen to go for Zollers. So this guy's going to attack Zollers. And to hit Zollers is a, probably a little bit easier. His armor class is only negative one, so they need a he needs an eleven to hit him. A four. They're very lucky. So this Frost Giant takes a big, like we always talk about, a big overhand, two-handed swing like this, dropping straight down, trying to hit him over the head like that, and he completely misses, meaning that you know Zollers kind of slides aside and moves back out of the way. And so this now is a chance for people to retaliate. This guy here is shuffling for a position, waiting for his chance. Let's see what we can do with uh, Elephanisi. With him having to wait out of his peripheral vision, he would be able to see her if she moves. So he could see this is peripheral vision, 180 degrees, okay? So 180 degrees means he would see her move. I'm going to have Elephanisi run a dart forward and engage him from the side. So let's do a little reaction check here. Here's how we want to do this. Let me pull Elephanisi's sheet up for you, okay? So she's our monk. She moves extremely quickly. She has a 24 movement rate compared to everyone else's 120. Um, her uh, dexterity is 17, so she gets a plus two roll of this. So the Frost Giant gets no bonus, so we're just going to roll for initiative between these two. Let's see how we go here. So six, this is the Frost Giant roll, six, seven, eight, and nine. Elf needs to get plus two to her roll. Five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, plus two is fourteen. She wins initiative, she gets two attacks on this Frost Giant. Right off the bat, she's still doing open handing that Minnie has a staff in her hand. She's going to do two open hand attacks. <clears throat> Excuse me. She needs a 14 to hit AC 0. Um, these guys are AC 4, okay? So that means she only needs a 10. I'll put this here for you. So she only needs a 10 to hit him, okay? So let's see what her rolls are. Her main hand and off hand. Let's give her the purple and the blue dyed roll. A 6 and a 1, so a complete flub. Now, you may have read my Patreon page about uh, flubs. Flubs are nasty business. When you flub something, um, I didn't designate left hand or right hand because these are open fist attacks. She's not kicking. Um, a flub means you're way out of position. So I'm actually going to have her, I'm just going to choose her right hand. She does a right cross, and she gets herself out of position, and she hits this rock. He's able to shuffle position back to the back and take a swing at her. I'm going to take her dex bonus away. Now, the funny thing about a monk is they don't usually get a dex bonus to their armor class. Um, it is a negative three, though. So I'm going to take that away, and I'm going to boost her armor class up to three. Okay? So for if this frost giant only needs to hit AC zero of a ten, okay, now we're just going to add, uh, take away three. He only needs a seven to hit her. Okay? So here's that roll for him. A two. Wow, that's really lucky because she doesn't have a lot of health. Okay, these guys are hitting for 66 with two-handed weapons. So he takes a big chop at her and she moves out of the way. So their be rats reset, their combat's reset. Varenjar gets to retaliate here, and then we're gonna have the retaliation attacks here. So Varenjar is uh, dual wielding, and one thing we always remember with him is his uh, main hand gets a minus two penalty. That's the only way D, uh, in D&D, the first edition, the way the uh, uh, offhand stuff works. In fact, let's just let's just do this real quick with this. Let me shuffle the sheet up a little bit here. We don't need to see that. There we go. So what I do is we use the red die for Varunjar's main hand, and so we take two off the red die. Now to hit AC zero, he only needs a two. He needs a twelve. These guys are AC four, so he needs an eight. So we take two off that natural twenty. I'm still going to deal double damage to that, but take two away from it. That means eighteen. Easy hit. Offhand a twelve. That's a hit. So double damage on Varunjar. He's going to do one d eight plus thirteen on each weapon. The plus 13 comes from this bonus to hit from his black axe. Each one of those axes has plus 3 on it. And his girdle of fire giant strength. Natural 20 is going to be nasty. Let's do the natural 20 versus this blue one. So we got 5. And it gets plus 13. So 5 and 13 is 18. That gets multiplied times 2. That's an easy 36. And then the offhand is 4. Plus 13 is 17. So 17 plus 30 is a total of 47 damage. So we're going to knock that off right here. Natural 20 is nasty. 
Let me clean the board up a little bit because they're getting a little nasty. What do we say? 47. You don't need the peripheral vision marker anymore. Let's take that off. And uh, hopefully the background sounds aren't too loud. I might have my producer check for me at some point. Let me know if it sounds all right. <laughs> um, so let's, we were marking off damage that was done. Let's take 47. These guys have 80 health. We're going to call this number one, two, and three. So number three is at 80. Okay. And we're just going to take 47 off of that. I've decided not to do math anymore. So 80 minus 47 is down to 33. So number three is down to 33 health. All right. So he's done his retaliation. Mercedes gets to attack. Um, she's going to attack the same one that was attacking Varenjar. Now for her to hit a... Um, for her to hit AC4 is really easy. She only needs a 6 to hit AC0. To hit AC4, she needs a 2 or higher. So it's going to be very easy for her to hit. She's going to do a two-handed, uh, she uses a two-handed weapon, just a two-handed overhand swing to try to cleave this guy in the back of the back on the spine. She's hitting him from behind as well. I'm going to take one armor class away from him, so she can only miss on a 1. So a 19, she hits him quite handily. Um, her damage against a large target is 3d6 plus 5. Let's just give the rules for that. Um, so we got, what do we got here? A 3. 4, 7, 8, 9, plus 5, 14. So we got 33 minus the 14. Let's see what kind of damage we got now. That puts him down to 19. And let me just do a quick sound check over here and see how we're doing. Okay. So this sounds like our background sounds are just a little too loud. I'm going to pull those down a little bit. Hopefully the volume level seems okay. Give me like 20 seconds to cross-reference this. Volume level's good or volume level's too low? It sounds good. Okay, great. This is all new experiments. So I appreciate the patience. There we go. All right, cool. So this first frost giant's been here. He's really damaged. He's still got 19 health left, okay? So he's still alive. He's not out of the fight yet. So Zolus is going to get his attack. But Zolus is only going to be able to attack the thing that's directly in front of him. Um, so to do that, i um, got to quit saying that. He only needs to hit, uh, it's the same thing as a Mercedes, he'll only miss on a 2, okay? So let's do Zolish's attack. A natural 20, oh my goodness, this is a good day for these kids. So that's double damage, all natural 20s are double damage. His is uh, interesting damage, he does 1d10 plus um, 5, so against a large target. See his large giants roll 1d10 plus 5, so 6 plus 5 is 11, okay? That's doubled for 22, and then there's a 1d8 fire damage, and I never double that because it's just a burning dot. It doesn't really have any effect, so plus 7, but it's 29 total. So this is giant number 2, okay, and we're going to take 29 off of him. So that will be uh, 80 minus 29 is 51. Okay, let's put him number down here to 51. Okay, let me just jack my own volume up a little bit more, because I think I'm a little soft. All right. Okay, so that put this guy down to 51. That's a natural 20. That's a nasty, really good hit, really good hit. So now we're over here to Elephanisi and this other Frost Giant. Now the Frost Giant attacked her. Elephanisi attacked. She missed. She was out of position. So what we're going to do with these two, because of the flub and the swing and the miss, I'm going to actually roll initiative again for these two. It's kind of like everything reset. Okay? Let's get Elephanisi sheet up for you, okay? And uh, hopefully this audio sounds good for you now. Thumbs up from the from the production team. <laughs> so let's do Elephanisi. She's going to get a plus two bonus, okay? So add two to this. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, plus two is a uh, thirteen. And let's give this frost giant here his initiative roll, just natural three d six. Ooh, that's a twelve, right? Six, seven, nine, ten, twelve. So let's do it. Just be absolutely sure we didn't mess up the mistake here. Natural twelve. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But see her dexterity? She has 17 dexterity. She gets plus 2. So 11 plus 2 is 13. So this is 6, 7, 9, 10, 12. He, she barely wins the initiative by 1. So that could be a real deal breaker for this guy because she's going to do a main hand off hat attack on him. Remember, he's AC4. So if, she was, if he was 0, she needs a 14. But she only needs a 10 or higher to hit him. So main hand or offhand, she has no penalties. Okay, this is real, sort of really nasty with a monk here. This is a natural 15, okay? If you remember if you watched our other episodes, when you're a monk and you hit five higher than what you're supposed to hit, you stun. And with an open hand swing, that means she's cracked this guy either in the stomach or a kidney shot or something like that. Based upon the height difference, I'll say that she hit him in an organ and stunned him. Um, so he's going to be stunned for four. 
uh, segments. A 24 second stun is really nasty. You can be killed in 24 seconds. So let's just do a quick little 3d6 roll to see where the knocks down and grapples in pain and tries to flub away. If anything, if I roll anything higher, we're going to take do it this way. Let's say this guy has 10 dexterity. He rolls 10 dexterity or less on 3d6. He maintains his balance, just kind of hunkers over. All right. It's four, five, six, seven, eight. So he's able to maintain his balance. He doesn't fall or stagger or move away. Still in combat, still able to defend himself. Let's roll her damage on that. So her offhand hit as well, if I'm not mistaken. So for her, it's 3 to 13. This is something that's kind of tricky. 3 to 13 is really 2d6 plus 1. So we're going to do that twice. Each one of these is going to get plus 1 added to it. So that's plus 1 added to that, plus 1 added to that. So let's total this up. So 3, 4, is that's a 5. So we have 5. Whoops. 5. And we have 6 and 10. Plus 1 is 11 and 11. So that total is 16. So this is a guy that has not been damaged yet, but he's now stunned. Okay? For 24 seconds. Really nasty. So we just pull this up real quick. 16 off this guy here. This is number 3. 3, 2, 3, 2, 1. So we're going to take 16 off of him. So what do we got here? 80 minus uh, 16. This gives us a 64. So this first guy's almost dead. He's only 19 health. This guy's at 51. And then 64 for this one here, but he's stunned. So what I usually like to do with a stun is you're the character. You're right on top of him. Before, you know, a segment means that I'm taking swings at you and you're parrying or moving out of the way. And like within six seconds, some combat's happening. Um, <clears throat> when your target stuns, she's going to get immediately get to do two more additional strikes. Okay? And you can stack stun on top of stun. So if she rolls, <clears throat> excuse me, if she rolls 15 or higher again on either one of these dice, she's going to chain stun him. There's an 18, there's another chain stun. So 24 seconds, add another 12, so 36 seconds. Um, unless these guys come to her aid, she's going to be able to kill him easily. Let's roll her damage on that one because uh, both of those numbers hit. So this will get plus one on this one. So that's a 10. The 6 and 3 is 9, plus 1 is a 10. And 2 and 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4. So we got 4 and 10 is 14. Let's take 14 off the 64. That puts us down to 50. So that's the, the immediate counterattack because this guy's stunned. So I'm going to have her slip into position this way and try to finish him this way. That way, if these guys come, she's able to move quickly out of the way. Now, when this guy gets hit and goes, Ugh, this guy does, can't take the chance to turn around and look. This guy's really heavily damaged. He's right next to the table. I don't think he's really going to do anything but try to fight to the death. This guy's she's preventing him from coming for the horn. This guy's still confident that he can be okay. The whole fight's only been by six seconds of the lap so far, so no one's really broken morale or anything like that. So let's go all the way back to the beginning and have this frost giant take a swing at Varinjar. He's very damaged now, but uh, let's see if he can do it. So because these guys hit really, 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 really hard. So Varinjar is AC negative two. These guys only need a ten. Okay, they only need a 10 to hit AC uh, 0. So to hit negative 2, they need a 12. There's a 1. That's a complete flub. So another overhand swing. This guy tries to take a huge, massive overhand swing on Rinjar. I'm actually going to give him a heroic opportunity to describe to me as a player what would you do when this guy swings and misses. I'm going to have Rinjar jump up on the table and then strike him with both axes in the side of the head and try to cut his head off. So this guy's way out of position, taking a step forward. And he's going to take a swing at this guy. I'll give him a plus 2, plus 1 bonus to hit. So, so Varinjar to hit AC 0, he only needs a 12. This guy's AC 4 normally. That means he only needs an 8. Okay, but I'm going to give him an extra bonus, so he needs a 7. So let's do the main hand. 7 or higher. Main hand. That's still a hit. That's gonna take 2 off of that. Uh, that's a 7. So both of them hit. Now his damage is really good. This will probably wipe this guy out. And then our cleric has moved up to this position. And our druid has moved into the doorway here, and Obscura has moved to this area here. So we have other kids in the party are starting to show up now for the fight. And we're going to pop this out one notch. There we go. You can see a little bit more. Pull this down. There we go. Okay, cool. So let's do Varenjar's damage. It's a 1d10. Um, one, excuse me, 1d8 plus 13. And both hands and main hands hit. Main hand and offhand both hit. we got two eight-siders right here. We're just going to roll both of them and add 13 to each one, okay? So the 2 and 13 is 15, and the 1 and 13 is 14. That's 29 total that kills this guy. He only had 19 health left, so this guy's dead. And I actually said the player could get an opportunity to call what his shot's going to be. Um, he cuts this guy's head off. So he just basically uses both axes and just goes chop and just cuts his head off. Something like that is worth a morale break. Um, 
this guy here, even though he's not really damaged, she's in position. She can take a step forward and cut him off. Uh, he just jumped on the table and heroically decapitated his friend. The head probably flew in the air. I'm going to do a real quick little initiative roll, and we're going to do it like this. If the party is confident, um, you're just going to do a straight up initiative roll. If the if the giant loses the initiative roll, his morale is going to break. Okay. So this is the initiative roll. This is a contested roll. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is the giant's roll. Five, six, seven, eight. So I'm going to call him morale break on this guy. He's going to try to disengage and go for the horn. Do you remember in the beginning we talked about the horn? So as he turns to move this way, he would. I'm going to have him do a quick little push attack to try to push these two off of him with a sword and like a like a punt move in baseball. And if he can do that with a minus five penalty, he can actually get away without encouraging it without having an attack of opportunity. So I'm going to have him try to hit Mercedes and Zolaris. We'll do individual rolls for this, okay? Um, for them to hit AC zero, they need a 10 to hit her. She's negative two, needs a 12. So I'm going to give him a five penalty. So he needs a 17 to do a push back attack on Mercedes. A natural 20, so he does it. So he does push her. She's going to have to do a dexterity check right off the bat. I'll give her her dex bonus, um, but she doesn't have one. She's 15, so she needs to roll 15 or less. I'm not. It's not a disadvantage. 15 or less to maintain her balance. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's what is this? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's right. It's a ten. So she maintains her balance, but she he pushes her back. So she can't do an attack of opportunity. Let's see. This is a natural twenty on her. Now, what was his uh, pushback attack be on Zolaris? So to hit Zolaris, because he's kind of doing the weapon like this, like both hands, like holding the weapon like this, just trying to push them back, and they could turn around and flee. He doesn't want to show his back. He's not a complete idiot. Let's get this out of the way because it looks ugly. All right, so to hit dollars, he needs to hit uh, negative one. So he needs to roll a, normally he'd roll a 10 plus one. He'd roll 11 or higher, but we're going to add that five to it, right? So he needs a 16 or higher to hit him. 15. So he tries to push back attack on Zollers. It doesn't work. Zollers can like duck down and he's just going to take his burning glaive and just thrust it straight forward. So he's able to pursue and take a thrusting attack on him. All right, so Zollers is going to get a chance to attack this bad boy. Hopefully he can damage him pretty well, but he won't kill him right out. There's just no way he can do enough damage in one melee round. All right, so to hit AC zero, he only needs a six. This guy is AC four. He only needs a uh, two or higher. So a only the only way he'll miss is roll a one, a two. So he still hits him, okay? So it's 1d10 plus five. So we'll just roll that for you real quick. That's a uh, 13, excuse me, that's 12. So you have 12 and you have another 1d8 burning damage, which is not doubled or anything, plus three. So that's a total of 15, that's a 3 actually. So let's check a look at our sheet here, see about the damage on everyone. Let's get rid of this math. So this was number 2, he was at 51, right? And we're going to take 13 away from him. So that's not very much damage. It's a decent burn, but it's not really that bad. Just maybe a nasty side wound into the leg. So it puts him down to 38 or so. Um, this guy's going to actually move away now. That was not really the attack of opportunity, but as he moves this way, I'm going to have Ella Fenisi jump in front of him and intercept him because she's able to she give up on trying to do a coup de gras on this guy, which she could do, but she's going to move in front and counter right in front of this guy and take two swings at him. So because he just did a swing, he turns around, he takes one step forward, and she's right in his face. So we're going to go ahead and have Ella Fenisi cut him off bravely and see if she can nail him. Let's get her sheet up for you so you can follow along. So for her to hit this guy, she uh, to hit AC4, she only needs a 10. So if either one of these are a 10, she nails this guy in the face. Remember, if either one of these are a 15, he's stunned too. There's a 17, so there's a stun. This is going to be really nasty. The stun on the monk is his biggest strength. They're one of the lowest health classes in the game. Um, let's roll the damage. This one here was a 9, so I think one of her offhands missed, correct? She, yep, she needed a 10 to hit him. That's a 9. So she does miss with one hand, but the one hand, maybe a right straight, jacks him right in the face. Let's do the damage. Let's do the stun duration on that. Two segments, 12 seconds of stun. Uh, where's our magnets? Let's get another. Let's put gray on this guy. Let's use gray on this dude over here, too. So the gray means like hazy vision and can't see good. This guy got a kidney shot. What would be the shot she'd stun him with? Right cross, right in the chest, knock the wind out of him because it's not a long-term stun. He's knocked on the ground. I'm not going to do a check to see if he's knocked unconscious. It's not long of a duration to stun to make him stagger and lose his balance, but his back is turned to Zolaris now. Mercedes out of position, and Vrinjar's on top of the table, so I think you know what's going to happen here next. Everyone in the back can just take a step forward. They can't really move into the room well. There's nothing else they can do. Let's do Elephantesi's damage. It's 2d6 uh, plus 1. Okay. So 3 and 3 is 6 and 7. So this guy is 50, takes 7 away, puts him down at uh, 
43. Brain fart. All right, but he's stunned. So Vrinjar, uh, Zalors can just go ahead and skewer him and kill him pretty easily. We're going to roll Vrinjar's attack. Give Vrinjar two attacks. And then I'll give Mercedes two attacks. And I'll give Elephanisi two attacks. Let's do Elephanisi first. Natural 20, that's a double damage. And a 10, that's going to hit him easily. Let's do Elephanisi's damage. We're going to add... We're going to take the... Let's do, the, let's do the, the blue and the purple is a double damage. Let's do it first. Okay, four and five. This is, uh, there's no bonus to this. Four and five is, four and five plus plus one is six times two is 12. And that's doubled. Okay, so that's 24. And then her offhand, two and two is four plus one is five. So 29 damage in her first attack. Let's take that off the sheet. 20, 43 minus 29. Puts him down to 14, and there's just no way he's going to live through this. Um, let's let uh, let's let Zollers get a swing on him, okay? 15. Zollers is going to do 1d10. Where's our 10 sider at? They're all, all whole tables getting covered with dice now. <laughs> let's do this. Where's the 10 sider? There we go. 1d10. Zollers has a bonus of uh, plus 5 to that, so that's 11 plus a d8 for the burning damage. 11 plus 1 is 12. This guy's gonna, I'm gonna call him dead. There's no way he's gonna lift that additional damage because the Mercedes can take a step forward. Um, let's say that uh, Zalos get two attacks on him and the second attack killed him. So this guy's stunned. So she's actually able to move. I'm gonna have her move one, two, three, four, five, six to secure this back wall. We don't need this here anymore. This guy's dead. I'm gonna have Ringer come and jump down on top of this and then jump down here. Yeah, I'm not going to make him even roll for that. It's just something simple he can do. Um, I'm going to have Mercedes rush forward and, and these two coup de gras this guy and kill him before he can even get up. So these these guards are wiped out dead. So let's do a little background roll because there's a lot of noise. Okay. And Elephanisi just poked herself in this area. So Elephanisi is looking down this area and she sees movement down there. And she doesn't really have an opportunity to hide in shadows because I'm going to roll for a little reaction here. So... Just to let you know, a little give you a sneak, sneak peek at this. If this roll is uh, higher than 12, they see her. It is higher than 12. So she's been spotted, and we're going to do, it looks like a number of additional frost giants are in the next chamber, but it's very darkly lit in here with only a couple of torches. They're going to come rushing forward towards her. She understands this is a bad situation, and she says, more are coming. So if Renjar turns this way, and immediately tries to slip into the shadows. And so she's going to back off one, two, three, four over to here. Mercedes turns this way. One, two, three, four. Zollers comes forward. One, two, three, four. Just in time for we we'll leave those corpses on the ground. And where's our box of baddies? Here it is. Here it is. Box of baddies. We need more baddies. Oh, you know what? I've already got them out. We don't need any more taken out of here. We've got a huge stack of them. I take your frost giants and I raise them by 70, right? No, we got two more frost giants coming into the room and more behind them. But we're going to see what happens here first. Now, I'm going to keep these frost giants oriented towards you so you can tell what they are. I'm not going to turn and rotate them like I do with the miniatures. So we have frost giants, two frost giants running into the room. We have Mercedes here. Zalers is here. This is a chance for the um, one, two, three, four. And Tola's going to jump up on top of the table. Obscure one, two, three, four. Stay behind him. The druid's going to... One, two, three, four. She'll make sure both these guys are dead. Now let's roll for initiative, okay? Now we have a straight up fight happening. So let's do it this way. Um, bad guy get initiative roll first, okay? Just a regular 3d6. That's a nice roll, that's a 10, that's 11. Let's get this out of the way here. So they get an 11. Let's do front life fighters um, first. So we're gonna give initiative roll for Mercedes. This is a group roll. Um, I'm going to have these two be a group. So I'll just do this as a group roll for the good guys. I'm not going to do the dex rolls on them. So they're going to lose that one, right? Five. This is three and two. It's five, six, seven. Six. So they lose initiative. So these two frost giants are able to engage, and they're going to split targets like this. So reinforcements have come from the other room. Um, now we have more horribleness happening. So this guy's going to come in hit with, a, with his two-handed axe. Two-handed axe and just take another overhand chop at her just right in the face. So what is it going to take to hit her? 
Uh, she's on the screen already. Remember, there's the same kind of frost giant. So what we want to do, we want to update this uh, sheet of hit points. We're going to call these guys number one and two. They're all max health and 80. Okay, so the two freshies coming in. These guys are all dead. These are dead. All right, so we can call this guy from the bottom to the top for you. This is number one. This is number two. Okay, both at 80 health. Let's see if they can hit Mercedes. All right, to hit her, they need a, what do they need? To hit AC zero, they only need a 10. To hit her, it's a negative two. They need a 12, a, to a 12 to hit Mercedes. A 12, round the money. That's 6d6 damage. That's very, 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 very nasty, okay? So this is gonna be a big roll here for them. Big two-handed, 12-foot-long battle axe roll. Let's see, let's roll over here by the north here so you can see the numbers. All right, so what do you got here? So you got a five and a five is a 10. And a two and a three is another is a five. Oh, we're missing a die. We're missing a die, aren't we? We need another d6 in there. One, two, three, four. Yep. So this is 10, 15, 16, 17. That's actually a pretty low roll. So we got a sheet we made here for um, player health. So we're gonna take 132 and take that 16 off of that, which will be pretty straightforward. Be 116. Okay. So Mercedes down to 116. That's not that big of a wound for her, but we're keeping track of it and keeping it honest. No other way to do it. Now, this other guy's attack on Zolaris. So Zolaris' armor class isn't quite as low as Mercedes. It's still pretty low. To hit him, they're going to need a, uh, a 10. I need 11. 11 or higher to hit Zolaris. An 18, that's an easy hit. So another 66 roll on him. Let's do it this way. We're going to roll it back down here in the corner for you again. Actually, you know, we'll do it right around here. How's that sound, right? 66 here. So what do we got for him? Excuse me. This 3 and 2 is a 5. And another 5 is 10. And 3 and 3 is another 16. So 16 damage on him. Zolrus is 156. So you basically take 156 and take 16 from it. And that'll give you 140. Okay? And just get this off the screen here. So we got 140 damage on Zolaris, down to 140, I mean. So 140, that's not that big of a deal. Now, we remember what we said, the players in the back, everyone gets a chance to do things. Um, I'm They lost the initiative, but they've done their strike. So now it's this turn's team. So these two are obviously going to counterattack. I'm actually going to have uh, Elephanisi moved, so I'm not going to give her a chance to do anything. The cleric is going to get on top of the table, a line of sight, not casting yet. The druid is just skewering both of these frost giants with her scimitar. And Obscure is just in position here with a line of sight looking to see what's happening, preparing to cast a spell in this area if more keep coming into the hallway. So let's do, uh, let's go to Varinjar. Now he stated that he wanted to hide in shadows and move silently. Let's do his hide in shadows check first. 75% on HS, 75 or less. 20, that's perfect. A natural 20 in a way on a percentile die. So he hides in shadows. Let's see if he can move silently. So his move silently is MS. And his 88% chance. Oh, right on, the, right on the money. 88. Wow, that's crazy. That rarely ever, ever, ever happens. What are the odds of that? So he's completely concealed, okay? In fact, if you want to make it fun, just put him on one of these blue markers here so he'd be taller. So he's hidden in shadows. It takes him that whole melee round to do that. To get over here by this torch, maybe snuff the torch out. Let's just say snuff the torch out. And then he was able to hide in the shadows here. And as this fight goes uh, goes on, he's got some interesting spaces he can move. And he can't really get around Zollers. He can't really get around Mercedes. There's a brazier burning here. Um, Elephanisi is here. So he's going to have to wait for an opportunity to attack. He can't really move this turn. So let's go back to these two and let Mercedes do her counter attack on the guy that damaged her. Okay. So we'll go back to her. There you go. So with her two-handed Zweihander, with her two-handed sword, what does she need to hit this guy? Same armor class as before. These guys are all AC4. She can only miss on a two. Only, excuse me, she can only miss on a one. There's an eight. That's a pretty easy hit. And her damage on this kind of guy is uh, 3d6. Let's get these six-siders out over here. I feel like I'm playing Traveler sometimes. Six, 3d6 plus five. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Twelve, thirteen. 13 plus 5 is 18. So we're going to take 18 off this guy. That's going to put him down to 62 if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Okay, so this first guy, we said 1 and 2, right? So this puts him down to 62 health. Alright, that's her damage. Zolaris. He can only do the same thing as her. He's the same kind of hit die. 
he uh, hit points. His roll to hit AC zeros hits a six. These guys are AC four. He can only miss on a one, a three, and bounce off him. He still hit it. Now his damage is a little bit different. He's a 1d8 and a, a 1d10. The 1d10 gets a bonus to it. So if you look at it carefully here, the 1d10 gets plus 5, so that's 12. Plus 5 is 17. So 17 total. Let's take that 62 and take... That's a different guy, actually. 80 minus 17. That puts us down to 63. So that was very close in damage. Both of them did. This guy here is down to 63. All right. Now we have the, uh, another situation where we can uh, determine what the actions are going to be. So you imagine you're sitting at the table with me, and so your two buddies are playing the two fighters. Now you think about each one of these characters here. What's the right thing to do? This isn't a real nasty situation. This is like a two, three, four round fight. Is there anything else coming? Well, I'm the DM. I'm just going to check here, okay? Okay. So there's movement behind in the shadows. There's movements back this way to the east. Let's just put a marker on this way. Um, but everything's choked up and no one can move forward. And I'm going to give Mercedes a uh, intelligence check to see whether she notices the movement in the background. So what we're going to do, we're going to do it as a disadvantage. This is not this is not a fifth edition rule. It's something I like to use as a homebrew rule. So I'm checking against your ability score to see whether you notice anything. Um, Ella Fenisi could say something, but I'm just going to have see if she can do it. So her intelligence is 16. <clears throat> Really good intelligence for a fighter, wouldn't you say? If she rolls a 16 or less on a d20, she notices the movement. Okay, so she notices the movement. <coughs> Basically, she could, excuse me, she can see there's frost giants shuffling for position off screen here in the shadows, moving to snuff out torches. She's going to vocalize this to Elephanisi. Elephanisi is going to run around here. And now see, I'll make a judgment call whether he's going to take an attack of opportunity on her or not as she goes by. So the first thing he needs to be able to do is realize that she's moving by so quickly. So let's just make a little perception check on that. So let's say this guy has 10 intelligence. If he rolls a 10 or less at a disadvantage on a d20, he realizes the monk's coming and thinks he should try to intercept her. 10 or less. A 6. So as Elephanisi tries to move by with her high movement rate, remember she moves twice as fast as everyone else, he's going to turn and take a swipe at her. Okay? So to hit her... Uh, she's AC 0, so he needs a 10 to hit her. But when he does this, he's going to expose his flank to uh, Mercedes. A 7. Wow, lucky. So he misses her, but now he's out of position. She's able to slip past him and move further down. So she's going to run down to here. Vrenjar realizes what's happening. I'm going to actually do the combat between Mercedes and him and Zalaris and this guy. And then I'm going to do something with Vrenjar, okay? So we're trying to take these in turn. Um, I'm going to have the cleric stay to here. Obscuro is going to move on top of the table as well. The druid sees Elephanese moving. One, two, three, four. She's going to get in position to perhaps do something like a task and entangle or anything happens here. She may yell out to her to try to kite them back, but she thinks that the enemies are running away to do an alarm, so she's going to run off screen and go stop them, which is nothing wrong with that. She could probably get away with it, especially with the confidence level being high. Now you're playing Varinjar, what are you going to do? He's going to have to wait for, the, I'm going to wait for the retaliation attack from the, from the Mercedes and from Zollers, and then I'm going to give him a chance to move and try to slip up on this table and jump down and run through this avenue here, which is five feet wide. All right, first things first. Let's do Mercedes. She can only miss on a one. Okay, an eight. Now the guy's hitting her from the flank, but I'm not going to give her an additional damage bonus. Get her sheet back up for you. It's 3d6 plus five. That's eight, nine, ten, plus five. It's 15. So this guy here was uh, number one. He's at 62. So we have four, five, uh, eight. What was that number again? Okay, let's do it again. It's plus five, right? So here's eight, nine, ten, plus five is 15. Okay, so we have 62. Yeah, 62 minus 15. That puts him down to 47. Okay. So he's out of position. I'm going to give her a chance to strike him again. I'm going to give him an initiative roll, okay? And then I'll come over here to Zolos. I haven't forgotten about him. Let's see if he reacts to her strike well enough to defend himself the next round, okay? So I'm going to give her her initiative bonus on this if she even has one. So her roll is 4, 5, 6, 7, a 10, a natural 20, 10. Her dexterity is not high enough to give her a bonus, is it? Nope, only her constitution is high enough. And his roll is 5, 6, 7, 8. So he doesn't have enough of a reaction adjustment to react to her striking him, so he's still out of position. So I'm going to let Mercedes swing again. Only misses on a 1. There's a 2. Still a hit, though. That's right off the camera here. Let's just slide this a little bit closer. There's a 2. 
And she's gonna do the same damage again. 3d6 plus 5. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, plus 5 is a 15. So we're gonna take another 15 off that 47. Okay. That's an easy one to do. You can do that one probably in your head. <laughs> that puts him down to 32. So this guy's really choking things up here. Alright. So now we're gonna go back to the Zolaris. Now we're going to go back to these two here, okay? And Vrindra is going to climb up on the table, which I don't even need to roll for that. And then we'll talk about what happens over here. So I was going to take a swing at this guy. He's going to try to push forward and push him forward. So I'm going to need to if we give him a minus two chance to hit. If he successfully hits, he makes this guy defend and staggers back. So he, only, he can only miss on a one. So if he rolls a... Th I'm going to make it even harder. I'm going to give him a, a minus five. So he, six or higher to strike him and push him back. A 19, perfect. So he pushes this guy back one square and able to follow through. This makes enough room for Vrindra to move through, but let's roll the damage first, okay? So he's going to do 1d10 plus 5. That's 10. And then 1d8 burning damage is 3. So his health was at 63. So we have 63 minus the, uh, a total of 13, if I'm not mistaken puts him down to 50. So this guy here is down to 50, and the other guy's at 32. They got a little puppy helper down here helping out. All right. So he's able to get the position. That gives Renjar a chance to jump down and run into here. He's hidden in shadows. So let's see. What we're going to do is we're going to have uh, Elephanisi and Renjar move off screen. Okay? So there's shadows in this area here, and they both move into the next room. Now, I'm, I'm going to let you see that combat. But for now, I'm going to say that these can't. So what we're going to do, we're going to do two more segments of combat here. And we're going to allow movement to happen. To, and uh, the Druid's going to try to follow. And Mercedes is going to try to do the same thing. And Zolus is going to try to reposition himself this way to come down the hallway to help her. So let's do it this way. What's the best way to do this? Um, to keep it fair, we're going to have uh, Mercedes roll for initiative against the guy directly in front of her. Even though she struck him well that last time. Okay, the bad guy rolls uh, 14. Hers is too low. He gets to go first. So this guy's going to overhand swing her again. What does he need to hit Mercedes? I believe it's a 12. Right? Hit AC 0. She needs he's a 0. 12 or higher and he hits her. A 4. He misses. Okay. So her chance to retaliate. Now she's going to try a called move again like the dollars did. They Maybe they're yelling to each other. Push them back. Push them back. Make room. We're choked up. So if she rolls a 6 or higher, she successfully pushes them back during her attack with her two-handed sword. If she doesn't roll a six, it's basically a glancing shot and misses, does no damage. A nine, so she still hits him. So she's actually driving him back against the wall to pin him against the wall, which makes room for the druid to slip through here. Okay, now what we're gonna do next is he's off balance, but he's actually facing this way. I'm gonna give him a chance. Can he do an attack of opportunity on the druid? And can he do attack of opportunity on the druid? So here's how we're gonna roll that. I'm gonna have this guy needs to roll a, uh, I'm going to have to roll a 15 or higher on a d20. This is just a judgment call. 15 or higher on a d20, okay? So this guy here builds a 15 or higher. A 1, no. That means he's completely out of position. So when he turns this way, we're going to give Zolaris a chance to strike him. And a 15 for him or higher. Let's roll it. A 3, no. So they can't get the druid and she slips fast. 1, 2, 3, 4, and I'm going to have her off screen. She's off screen. So she runs into the shadows of the next room. So this guy turned to take a swing, and this guy tried to make a move too. So I'm going to give Mercedes and Azalus their chance to counterattack. We'll just do it from left to right with Mercedes first. Whoops. We're just rolling really to see if there's a natural 20 happening. So she's 3d6 plus 5. So 5 and 5 is 10. Plus 3 is 13. Plus 5 is 18. Let's see what we got going on here. Uh. Yeah, hang on just a half a second here. Um, give me 20 seconds here. Let me just do something big about this character. I'm going to close this panel down real quick. And move this over here. And that way I don't have this on screen. Give me just 10 seconds. I'm curious which one uh, which one were you looking for? 
Okay. This one here. Okay. Hope that gives you what you need. You see it all right? Cool. My producer's playing WoW in the background. They want to roll my. want to play my warrior. <laughs> yeah, you can play my warrior. Go ahead and level them up to 120 while I'm doing D&D. That sounds good to me. All right, so here's what we need to do. Um, let's get this sh character sheet player panels back up again. And, no, no, no. Stop doing that, Windows. All right, let's see if we can get this. Up. I'll have to realign this panel real quick. Just bear with me. Just take us a second. That's pretty close. Pretty close. Okay, you don't need to see the experience anyway. We can just pull this up like this. There you go. All right, great. We're back in action. Sorry for the delay. I believe I was doing, um, I just done the damage with Mercedes on this guy and I was in the process of writing it down. I think I, I did think I damaged him already down to 32. So we're gonna go move to Zolaris's attack on this guy over here, the one on the north. So let's get Zolaris' sheet up. Now, if you play my warrior, you have to play protection spec. <laughs> that way you can't be killed in PvP and you just stun lock everyone. Now, who knows what they've done to the warriors in WoW. And they always keep making Fury cool. I don't know why. All right. So, Dollar can only miss on a one. He pushed this guy back. I'm actually going to let this guy retaliate back. I'm having him retaliate back against Mercedes. So, let's guy, let this guy... Uh, I'm going to do the roll against Dollar, and I'm going to go back to this roll against Mercedes. So, to hit Dollar, he only needs a um, 11 a one, a complete flub. So he takes a big overhand swing and gets himself out of position. And Labzalus is able to slide around the side and take a jam at him from behind. A 17. That's way up here in the corner if you can see that. Zalrus' damage is going to be a 1d10 plus 1d8. The 1d10 gets a bonus. Let's get this back up here so we can see it. So that's plus 3. Excuse me. Uh, the 3 plus 5 is 8. And 4 is 9. And this guy is at... 50 health minus the 9 puts him down to 41. Not a real nasty hit. He's at 41. We're just keeping it honest here. So we got 41, 32, and 41. Okay. Let's put these dice up here. So many dice. No low birth or anything, right? I can't wait to do this with a traveler one day. It's going to be a riot. That is a game people really need to. I mean, I know first edition DD is old school. Wait till you play traveler. It's really brutal. Died in character creation, right? Okay, so. Let's do the other guy's going to attack Mercedes. Let's give him a roll here. Um, you know, her, she's AC negative two, so he can hit her on a 12 or higher. There's a 10. It's a miss. It's very lucky. Kind of a crappy roll, but still. All right. So now Mercedes is going to take an over. It's going to take a step here to the left and overhand swing this guy to put a big hurt on him. But instead of trying to finish him, the reason why she's going to do this is taking too long to finish him. I would normally do the combat with this trio off screen. But I'm not going to because we're doing this with a video and I don't want to keep swapping maps back and forth. So I know what's happening in another room. I've got notes on it. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give these kids here an opportunity to do something. So um, the cleric's going to actually jump down and he's going to move around here and engage in melee with this one. Obscure's going to come over here and see if she can jury rig this horn to, be, to, to make it where it's unusable. So Obscure's going to turn and mess with this horn. Let's take a look at her real quick. Well, we haven't done anything with her in a long time. She's very intelligent. She's got high intelligence, 18 intelligence. I'm going to give her, a, she doesn't need to roll a die or anything, but here's what I'm going to say to her. This thing is a huge, it's like carved stone. It's on a wooden stand. It's got chains hanging from the ceiling. It doesn't move around. It's like having a huge engine block hanging from the ceiling. The only way she could do anything here is break the end of this nib off. So she's going to take the dagger she has in her pocket and try to pry that nib off. Um, I'm going to give her a roll of the d20 to see if she actually does that successfully. If she rolls a 10 or higher, she successfully breaks the end of the horn off. So she rolls a 3. She's still chipping away at it. So she's trying to break the horn. All right. So now we go back to combat here. The cleric is in range. I'll have him take a swing. Then we'll do the next attack. So the cleric, you know, he's not a melee guy. But in this situation, still, he can hit on a 10 or higher. So let's give him a roll. A 15. Now his damage is just going to be uh, 2 to 8 plus 4. Um, 2 to 8 would normally be two four-siders, right? They're kind of weird. Plus 4. So that's, you read the top of them, right? If you haven't played, these four sires rarely come up indeed. I don't think anyone even uses them anymore. So in this situation, this is plus four. So two and two is four plus four is eight. This is number one. So we'll take eight away from 32. That'll put him down to 24 health. Let's get Mercedes rolling him as well. That's 11. She's going to do 3d6 plus five. Just so you make sure you keep it on the honest level. Okay. 
So her damage is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, plus 5 is 14. 14 from 24 puts him down to 10. This guy's really damaged. I'm going to give him a morale break check. So here's how we're going to do that. I'm going to give him 3d6. If he rolls 10 or less, he doesn't break morale. Okay? So it's like a saving throw. Um, so his intelligence, or let's say his intelligence is 8. So if he rolls 8 or less, he doesn't break morale. 6. No, he, he fails this. So he's going to try running. So as he takes a step, there's going to attack of opportunity for both of these. Mercedes did hit this guy the last round, but she's going to finish this guy off. So let's let the cleric get the first swing in there. Um, a 15. I'm pretty sure that hits pretty easily. He only needed a 10. This is 2d4 plus 4. Funny little four-siders are so goofy. 2 and 1 is 3 plus 4 is 7. That puts him down to 3 health. And if Mercedes even lands a hit... This guy's dead. So this guy splatters and falls on the ground. That gives a cleric a chance to fall through and Mercedes to take a step forward. This dude's always his attack on that guy right there. And let's get these dice out of the way because they're clogging the things up. Let's put these four siders back in the retirement income fund. Um, Zalers can only miss on a one. There's a 14. Let's give him a D10. Where's our D10 at? Here it is. D10 and a D8. Do the same colors for fun. Remember the D10 gets a plus five for Zalers. Okay. So... So 5 plus 5 is 10, plus the 5 burning damage is 15. That's on the guy with 41 health left, okay? So the 41 health health guy minus the 15. He's pretty wounded. That puts him down to 26. Now when his other friend morale broke, but he died, um, I'm going to do the same thing, okay? And see whether his morale breaks as well. Now there's no real rules in D&D. &D. You could do it as a saving throw. Like you make a saving throw versus a spell or charm or something. It's just an intelligence thing. You know, that's one thing in role-playing games you can always do. You have statistics or ability scores for a reason. So, let's say this guy has 8 intelligence. If he rolls 8 or less, that means he can do what he'd like to do. Okay, if he rolls higher than that, he's kind of out of control. It's like a reverse saving throw. It's a skill check or a st stat check. If it was a saving throw, you said so, so you had a saving throw. Like, look, look at uh, Zalrus' sheet, right? To save versus uh, paralysis of poison, he's roll a 7 or higher on a d20. That's pretty easy to do. 13 out of the 20 dies of the 20 slots will it's like what is that 50 65 percent chance to succeed so anyway eight or less this guy is able to flee if he rolls eight or higher he uh well how would we do that eight or less and he just tries to he can try to flee eight or higher he stays to fight to the death okay eight or higher he's going to stay and fight to the death so he's going to turn and take a swing at the uh at zollers the person he's been fighting the whole time see if you can just give him a final gasp of power an 18, he hits him. It's uh, 66 damage. These guys hit really hard, a lot more harder than they would in the original game. So let's put four black dice in here, and four and two more of the colored ones. 66 damage on Zolaris. All right, that's nasty. I see some sixes. Here's a six, 12, 13, 14, 15, 20, 9. So they've got Zolaris' health right here. 29, he was at 140. Let's put this like this so you can see it. All right, so let's just do the math on that real quick. It's 140 minus 29. Puts him down to 111. Okay, we'll just update this real quick. Keep it honest. 111. All right, this is our party health over here. I'll put this down here by the north arrow. You can see it. No one's hurt too bad. Now this guy still has uh, 26 health left. Okay, Mercedes is going to go ahead and jam in the back, and it's going to be easy swing. She can only miss on a one. There's a 3, excuse me, a 13, 3d6, plus 5. Remember, she's, she's keep the sheet up here. So you, get, you get to a point where you memorize these numbers, but it's still good to have it up. So that's going to be 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, plus 1 is 11, plus 5 is 16. This guy has a 26 health. That puts him down to 10 health. Uh, the cleric's going to swoop around to the side and attack him as well. Remember the cleric, despite the fact he's not a heavy melee damage dealer, he still strikes pretty well. Um, a 10 or higher and he hits, that's an 11. His damage is 2d4 plus 4. So 4 and 1 is 5, plus 4 is 9. This guy's at 10 health. I'm going to call him dead. So this guy got swarmed and killed right on the spot. Okay, so what happens? Now that these guys have been dispatched, everyone can move into the next room and we'll switch the maps now we have a new set of baddies in the next room it just keeps chaining from one room to the next let's get all these dice out of the way 
and we'll be able to put all the other characters on screen. We're gonna get everyone off screen here real quick. And get these corpses off the screen. If we can have enough dead frost giants. That's four frost giants slaughtered in that room. Cleric, you got a chance to smack one on the head. I got the map right here. Let's get this map out. Okay, I got the map. And let's clear this off of junk. And I'm going to zoom the camera back out a little bit. There you go. You can see my cool magic marker over here. And let's get this switched and then we'll readjust the uh, camera position for the next room. Put this here like this. All right. Set this down. We'll just reuse this tape. One thing about having their maps drawn ahead of time is just like you make your own custom battle maps forever. You don't have to like buy one or click together a bunch of stuff. If you don't like to draw, I can understand. Um, it really saves a lot of time. You could do this on a computer, but having the glass on top makes it so much easier. Now, the one thing I want to do with this this map that's a little tricky is it's oriented. I'm going to orient it a different way than I would normally. So bear with me while I adjust the camera position here. I'm going to make this camera view much bigger. So we're going to put this down like this. Oops, not that one. Don't want to move that. Let's do this like this. You don't need to see this bottom part. We do want to see the top here, though. There we go could move this up down a little bit so I'll tell you what I'm gonna do this is not something I normally do but we're gonna swap the swap swap the north direction for you okay okay got everything on the screen there that looks pretty good okay let's get this stuff taped down tape this down here and let's tape this down over here Okay, so so usually, which light is that? This one here. Let's move these lights back so you don't have so much glare. Move this one back a little bit. There we go. All right, and we're gonna trim off the the uh, monkey business. You don't need to worry about that. There you go. And then we can make this bigger. Okay, so. North is rotated, all right? This is the one thing that's a little bit different about this map. So everyone's coming in from this way, all right? Now the last map, you remember, remember North was to the top, okay? So this is the direction you were fa facing the room when you were fighting in this other room before. So what's happened is everyone's moved to the west, okay? So imagine that map would be connected to this one like this, like that, all right? I know it's a little, I've never really done it this way before, but it's just because this room is so large. It's the only way I can really get it all on screen at once. So let's just get everyone on screen first. So first we have Varinjar over here, hidden in shadows. We have Elephanisi over here behind this pillar here. We have a frost giant over here, a frost giant over here by a door, fumbling with keys. We have another frost giant over here by the door. We have another frost giant here with his uh, battle axe out menacingly. And he is playing a little cat and mouse game with Elephanisi. Now we have Mercedes and Zolorus. There would be switch positions because they were this way. Mercedes comes here. Here's Zolorus on the front line. Step into this chamber, closely followed by the cleric. And Obscura will come on, and a Drew will come on. Uh, in a moment so we'll leave them off screen for the time being so what's been happening this whole time let's turn these guys this way so you can see what's going on and let's give you an overview of the room so remember everyone came from this area okay remember the north is up to the top now so this is west this is east this is south so Ele first wrench our hidden shadows he's concealed in shadows he came to this room there was a bunch of guys and i'll just, I'll just play it out for you these guys were sitting at this table. There was a torch lit here and here and here. The other torches were not, were, this one's illuminated over here, this one's illuminated here, and one was over here. When they heard the fighting in the other room, um, one guy got up and ran over here and doused this torch. This guy came over here and doused this torch. This guy whispered to this guy, what's going on? This guy whispered back to him that there's, they're being attacked. 
He's run down to here to go open the gate, open the gate. There's a large, heavy timber set of uh, poles over here, and it's got a big, nasty gate, and these guys are fumbling with keys. He had to run back to his cloak and get the keys, and he's fumbling with keys, a huge key ring to how to open the gate because it's locked. This guy then re retreated back with his weapon out. He saw Elephanisi coming into the room, and he's at and Elephanisi came this way, and they're kind of playing cat and mouse around this pillar. This is a huge floor-to-ceiling rock formation, huge floor-to-ceiling rock formation. For, and this is water. This is like a you know frozen mountain string water into a puddle here with the slagmites and slagtites hanging above. So there's a little full floor-to-ceiling rock formation here. Another boulder door here. Another boulder door over here. This is a torch that's burning here. We got torches burning like this. These are all being drawn into this area here. This torch goes up in this passageway here. This one's being pulled down this way. And we have a torch that was snuffed here. This one's out. This one's out. This one's out. So these torches that were here have all been put out. Okay? So now you get a sense of like how this area here, the only light source really is this torch here. This torch here creating this whole area here is in darkness so you can see into the illuminated area and everyone can know which way to go but mercedes uh elephantisi moving back and forth he can't see what she's got what she's doing they, not like they have infravision or something and this area here is being illuminated these torches are illuminating this area here and there's torch light coming in here so these guys are all being you know kind of freakily uh, illuminated so these this frost giant um then backed up here this guy has run back down to here he's facing this way he's facing this way as if they're going to prevent anyone from coming through here and that's our basic setup so let's just clear off these torches so you know which ones are illuminated which ones are not all right so this has kind of been a stalemate until the rest of the party's arrived because this other guy is fumbling for these keys and he's basically grabbed the wrong set of keys so he's fumbling with a lock and his buddy's saying hurry up open the gate there's nothing else that's around that's going to um, do anything these guys are what's going what's taking so long so now that the other group comes into the hallway she's mercedes comes to here and we're going to roll for initiative and that initiative is going to be between these two here and ranger is just going to stay hidden in the shadows all right ready to have some fun this will be our last room for the night for this one so first let's do bad guy roll make sure you can see everything right and let's uh let's crop this in a little bit you don't need to see all that garbage there let's get this cleaner looking there you go you know what i'm gonna do something for fun here i'm gonna change the tune let's play something else let's play another ambient track in the background they're all about the same aren't they creepy quiet castle that sounds kind of cool there we go. We're going to play Creepy Quiet Castle in the background. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too loud. It's probably very soft, actually. All right, initiative roll. Here we go. Bad guys. These two guys in the front line here. What do they got? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. What's our party got? We're going to do just a general party roll here, okay? 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So they win initiative, but they're going to hold. He's going to take a step back. He's going to take a step back. So they're not engaging in combat. When they see her come running down the corridor and him coming behind her, Elphanese is going to slip over here and try to hide in shadows. So let's do this real quick. There we go. All right, so Mercedes so is going to come charging forward. One, two, three, four. Zosh right behind her. One, two, three, four. These guys need to hold their ground now. Um, I'm a Zol uh, One, two, three, Four. Vrindra's going to come around this way. Elephantisi can try to hide in shadows. Let's let her do her roll real quick. Let's get her sheet up, okay? So, this is percentile rolls for her. Okay. We need the sound of giants roaring in the background, right? So, what does she need to uh, hide in shadows? For her, HS is 68%. 24, she does that easily. To move silently because I want you to do both. It's not like a spot listen check in the old in the second edition or whatever third edition. Move silent. She needs 83, 34. Okay, so she conceals herself as well and she's following uh, Vrinjar's lead and they're going to move across this way. And let's just get this. Now they're moving into torchlight, but they're using these columns to create shadows. Okay. So Mercedes and this guy's going to take a step forward and Mercedes and Zollers are going to engage this guy in combat. The cleric. One, two, three, four. And the druid, one, two, three, four. 
and then Obscura is going to take up the rear, and we can see what's going to happen here. Should we get things a little closer? Let's move a little closer because our fight has moved up the map a little bit. We're going to move this up like this, a little bit better detail for you. There we go. Now you can see a little bit better what's going on. Get a random die up here. All right, so <clears throat> the initiative roll. Our party, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Frostshank gets the first attack. He's going to take a swing. Let's just do a quick determination. One to three is Zolaris. Anything higher goes for Mercedes. So he goes for Mercedes, not Mercedes, but Mercedes. So the Frost Giant's the same thing as always. Let's get a sheet going for their health numbers, okay? So we got four guys down here. One, let's do it this way. One, two, three, four. So we're going to say one and two, and then down here is three and four. These guys are at the gate. Okay, so the 80, 80, and 80. And let's see if anyone's gotten damaged yet. These are FGs. And this is room number, did I number this room? I didn't number it. I think I got it marked here on my map. It's not really a numbered room, it's an interstitial space. Hee <laughs> hee, fancy word. All right, so let's take a swing. Let's do some damage. Then I say you roll a six, he's gonna go for Mercedes. Yep, okay, so let's do it. Where's that D20? Here he is. He only needs to hit her with a uh, 12 or higher. Same roll as always. A 15, that's 66 damage on her, a pretty nasty hit. Okay, we can roll this down here now because you can see better. 66 damage on Mercedes. Oh, there's a bunch of low numbers. So what do we got here? We got a five and a five right off the bat. That's gonna give us a 10, 10, and then we have one, two, three, four, five. So only 15 damage total. And where do we have our sheet for uh, the party? So Mercedes was at 116. That puts her down to 101. Okay. Let's just keep it honest here. She's at 101. Put this over here. She's at 101. Nasty damage. Not too bad, though. Not too bad. And now... Let's have uh, Zolaris and then Mercedes attack. So first Zolaris is going to take a swing at this guy. He hasn't been damaged yet. He only hit... Oh, he misses on a one. So that's once again, it's a flub. So he's going to take a big lunge and try to hit him with his... Uh, try to take a lunging attack and try to hit this guy with his pole arm. But he's out of position. And he overextends. And the Frost Giant can take a swing to the right and take a swing at him. I'm actually going to give him an attack of opportunity on Zolaris because he's so out of position. So to hit him, he only needs... That's a 10. Um, he needs 11 to hit him. But because of the attack of opportunity, I'm going to say that that hits. Okay, let me explain that to you real quick. Normally, if two characters are fighting each other and defending, they're actively aware of fighting each other, the roll to hit number is the number you see on the sheet. So the, for the Frost Giants to hit AC0, okay, they only need a 10. See this right here? They only need a 10. But because he rolled a one, he flubbed his, his lunging attack with his burning glaive, he's out of position. And since he's right-handed, his whole right shoulder is exposed. So since his right shoulder is exposed, he's gonna get attack of opportunity on him. I'm just gonna give him a bonus of one. So he only needs an 11 to hit him because he's negative one, but the 10 then hits so because of the bonus. So, all right, 66 damage on the side on Zolaris. This could be nasty. It's a lot of damage. All right, what do we got here? Well, some more ones and stuff. So we got a f we got two fives again. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That's not too bad. 16 damage on uh, Zollers. He was at 111. So let's just get our cool calculator up here. The Mercedes was at 101. Zollers was at 111. 111. And what did we say this was? 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 damage. Minus 16. Puts him down to 95. Windows 95, right? Nasty hit. So, that's that attack. Renjar's going to move 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. He's actually going to decide whether he's going to go for this one or this one. Now, you're the player sitting at my table. I'm going to give the option. You're hidden in shadows. You're with the monk. Hidden in shadows moves twice as fast as you. Do you want her to wait for you, or do you want her to go ahead? She's not going to be able to backstab, but she could stun these guys. I think he's going to have confidence in split, because no matter what happens, she's going to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation. This guy hasn't been attacked yet. The rest of the party could engage and handle it, but I think he wants the glory to go ahead and just eliminate this guy because he's bloodthirsty. So I'm going to actually have him, in his next turn, backstab this guy. I'm going to have her, in her next turn, try to attack this guy from behind. He's facing the wrong way. 
All right, now we're going to do some damage here, retaliating, Zellers attacking, and then Mercedes attacking. Remember, Zellers can only miss on a 1. There's a 3, that's a hit. And for him, it's a D10, and then a D8. The D10 gets plus 5. So 8 plus 5, 13, plus 2 is 15. And let's get our giant health up here. This is number 1. And so we're going to take 80, take 13 away from it. That's pretty easy. It's like 17, I believe. I mean, 63. 67, excuse me. So that puts him down to 67. Now Mercedes gets her attack. She only missed on a 1. 13. Normal hit. 66 plus 5. 4, 5, 6, 7 plus 5 is 12. Let's take another 12 from that 67. It's down to 55. So the, the first guy here, this guy's at 55 health. They've had their two combat rounds. Um, what's this guy going to do? So he's standing here. They want initiative. He didn't see anyone. I'm going to have him try to take a step forward and assist his comrade by taking a swing at Mercedes. We're going to go ahead and let him do that attack right off the bat. So a 9. Is that a 9 or is that a 6? That's a 6. So he misses. He does an overhand swing against Mercedes. Maybe she like dodges out of the way and defensively turns this way to face him, but she doesn't lose position on this guy. So she, while he's doing that, Renjo is going to come up from behind and do a backstab. Here's where the death and destruction is going to happen. So this is an attack from behind. The guy's flat-footed. Um, I'm going to take away. They don't really use a lot of dex bonus on giants, so we're just going to keep it normal. So AC 0, he needs a 12. These guys are AC 4, actively defending. I'm going to say AC, uh, AC uh, 5. So let's just give him a 7 or higher, okay? Take two away from the first roll. That's still a uh, 15. That's a hit. A 7. That still hits. That's offhand. It doesn't have a penalty. All right, so the damage. This is a quad backstab damage, if you can believe it. Look at the character sheet. See where it says thief abilities in yellow, where PP is for pickpockets, OL for open locks. Now quad surprise backstab damage. So his damage is 1 to 8 plus 13. Okay, each one of these is get plus, th both of those are hits. Each one of these is plus 13, and they are both uh, quadded. Okay, so let's, let's add the numbers up over here, because this is probably going to blow this guy up. So you got a 3. Okay, a 3 and a 13 is 16. And a 2 and a 13 is 15. So this, each one of these is multiplied by 4. Okay? So 16 times 4 is 64. 15 times 4 is 60. That's 124 total damage. This guy's splattered. So he just ruptures his spine and busts him open and blood goes everywhere. And Mercedes has to flinch to get out of the way. So as usual, you know, Renjar's damage bonus from this uh, fire giant girl strength and his quad backstab damage is really overpowered in first edition. Uh, totally obliterates this dude. We'll get this cleared off here. We've got a sense of where one's in the light now. We don't need these little torch things going. So that's happened. This guy's engaged in combat. His health isn't doing too bad. Um, our party's not damaged too badly. What would the rest of the party be doing? Obscura's still waiting to see what's happening. I'm with the druid run forward. One, two, three, four. And the cleric, one, two, three, four. He still thinks he may need to support the folks that are wounded because Mercedes down to what, 101? And uh, Azalaris is down to 95. 90, 95. So these guys are damaged. I mean, he's taken over 50 points of damage. He's still wounded. He may need to heal him. He might heal him. I don't think he's going to waste a spell just yet. This giant that's right here. Um, where's the giant sheet? Here's the giant guys right here. This guy's at 55 health. So he's still a threat. He can still do a lot of damage. 66 damage, a maximum of 36. He can still two-shot him if he hits him twice. All right. So we have Elephanisi around the corner here. She comes around the corner. Now, what would you do? Now, the thing about the monk that's kind of interesting, um, they don't get the pickpocket ability. They get all the other uh, you know, thief-like moves, like open locks and find and remove traps, move silently, hear noise, you know, hide in shadows, climb walls. I'm actually going to have her climb the wall in the shadows right here, and there's a plan behind this. So I'm going to have her do her roll first to see if she can climb walls. Uh, her climb wall percentage chance is 99%, so only if she rolls 100 does she fail it. Okay, so 54. She's got a 24 move around. I'm say, okay, you climb the walls, you grab the wall, grab a foothold. What do you do? I'm going to jump and leap over this fence over the top of this gate. Imagine these things are poles that are sticking up like this, right? So you got all these poles sticking up like this. She's going to leap over and get on the other side of this gate. 
and then surprise these guys from the other side to make them think the other stuff's attacking, but she's not going to lose her stealth in the shadows. So she's on that side. These guys haven't done an action. Um, th with the fighting, this guy being splattered, they're going to have to determine whether they try to continue opening the gate or they try to get out of here. Um, with this onslaught of everyone rushing in and then what they heard happening in the other room, I'm going to just going to flat out say without doing a roll that they're just trying to keep the gate open. Um, we're going to do a, a D20 roll. They finally found the key. He's got the key, sticks it in the lock, try to open the padlock, pull the padlock off, and push the gate open. Unfortunately, uh, Elephanisi's in a position where if they slam that door open far, 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 it's going to hit her in the face unless she gets out of the way. So the best way to do this is uh, let's do a dexterity check. Say so these guys have nine dexterity. He had to roll nine or less on a D20 to uh, get that lock open, or he's going to fumble. Okay? A 15. So he fumbles the lock, trying to get the lock, and drops the key on the ground to grab the key. So they waste more time, and this guy's just yelling at him. All right? So let's go all the way back to the beginning of the combat round. I'm going to have Obscura move to this position here. One, two, three, four. Now we have more combat with Mercedes and Zolaris, and the cleric is in the back supporting. Renjar's just killed this guy. He can be able to attack. So these three here, um, Renjar, Mercedes, and Zolaris can all attack. I'm going to let Zolaris go first. Remember, he can only miss on a one. Okay, let's get his sheep so you can see his damage. And the guy that they're attacking, he's down to 55 health. So it's going to be 55 minus whatever we put in next. All right, so we've got a D10 and a D8 roll for damage for him. The D10 plus plus 5, that's 15. Plus 1 is 16. So he's guys at 55 health. Take the 16 away. That puts him down to 39. This guy's gotten hurt pretty bad. This guy's flat out died. 39. All right, and now Mercedes attack. She only missed on a 1. There's a 12. She does 66 plus 4, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just double check, pull her sheet up real quick. Yep, 66 plus 5. 3d6, excuse me. 3d6 plus 5. So for her, we got a 4, and a 2 is 6, and a 6 is 12, plus 5 is 17. So 39 minus the 17. This guy's going to die pretty quick here. Puts him down to 22. He's still alive. Still holding the line, okay? Um, I have to let Vrinjar get his attack. Main hand is minus 2. That's a 7. Off hand, a 14. And this guy is considered actively defending now, right? These people are in his front flank, so there's no major bonuses. So Vrinjar to hit AC 4 would only need an 8. So this 9 still hits, and a 14 hits. Now, no, there's none of this crazy quad backstab damage going. This time it's just good old-fashioned damage. But for him, it's a pair of 8-siders plus uh, 13 on each. Okay? So we got 6 and 13 is uh, 19. And 13, that's 14. Add this two together. This is 3. 33 damage. This guy had 22 health left, and he's dead. Splattered. So they're just systematically plowing through the lines here. They're epic heroes. We expected anything less? All right. So with that happening, let's see if this guy got the gate open yet. One last chance. Let's get a d20 roll for him. If he rolls a 10 or less, he's able to get the gate open. A 7. So he gets the padlock open, throws it to the side, and pushes the door open. So when he pushes the door open, let's give Mercedes, uh, excuse me, uh, Elephanisi a chance to get out of the way. She got high dexterity of 17. We're going to give her just a regular unmodified uh, dexterity check so she gets out of the way. Okay. So it's a 5 and a 4 is a 9 and a 10. So she easily moves out of the way, but she's out of the way. This guy comes pushing in, and he pushes in behind him. They can go one at a time. All right? So let's do an initiative roll for whoever's in the front. I'm going to do an initiative roll because this is uh, 1, 2, 3. This is twin This is 15 feet away. This is the length of the free throw line to the edge of the basketball goal on a basketball court. So I'm going to give all three of the frontline characters an initiative roll to see who gets to move first as they try to pursue these guys and attack them from behind. So let's just give a, a Mercedes roll first, and we'll just keep track of this on the glass so you can see it. This is where stuff could really change the tide of battle, so we're going to do it this way. This We're going to go M for Mercedes, X for Zolaris, and B for Vrinjar. Okay, what do they roll? Let's go Mercedes from the top, Mercedes first. Okay, five, six, seven. She rolls a seven. It's unmodified. What does Zolaris roll? Um, he has no dex bonus either. They're both at 15 dex. Natural 3d6. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And six is 15. And then last is Vrinjar. His will be modified because he's high dexterity. So he has strength, intelligence, wisdom, then dexterity 17. He's going to get plus two to his roll. Okay, so he has five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, plus 2 is 13. So, Zollers goes first. 
Renjar goes second, and third is Mercedi. So Zalrus is able to one, two, three, four, attack this guy in the back. Renjar gets to go second. And Mercedes is in the back and she didn't make it in time, so she's choked. I'm gonna have the cleric move forward and we're going to uh, have Elephanisi take a step forward. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna adjust the camera a little bit so you can see what's happening because we're kind of spilling over into this next room. Let's just slide this over. We'll just over like that, give you a little bit of a view of the table. So what you got here, the edge of my dice table where the fabric is and stuff. So we've got Elephanisi going to intercept this guy. I'm just going to put her right here on top of him to attack him. So let's do the attack with Dolores and Vrinjar to hit this guy in the back. Actually, we should do one with Elephanisi first because she's going to jump out and probably surprise this guy. And if she can get a stun off on him, he'll be stunned. And this guy here will stumble into his comrade. So let's see this. Hope that's what happens. That's her biggest strength is the open hand stuns, okay? I tell you what, and this is going to be a heroic moment. They need a little more heroic music for that. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. We'll just play this one. This one's cool. you got to go check out the Sword Coast Soundscape site. It's really, really neat. I can't wait to do it more often. So we've got this roll done, and we're going to do Elephanisi first. So what does she need to hit this guy? Okay. He's AC4. He's running forward. He's kind of actively defending. He's kind of barreling through the doorway. Um, oh, she needs a 10. Okay. We'll do a main hand, off hand swing for her. Open hand. If either one of these is a 15, there's a stun. Ah, one, a flub, and a nine. So she uh, she misses. Both attacks miss. So she kind of jumps out of the shadows. This guy's like, whoa. And she just swing at him with the left hand and the right hand, and she completely misses. She's out of position, staggers forward. Since these guys were already in the process of trying to flee, he's just trying to push her out of the way. So let's just have this guy roll an attack to hit her. If he rolls a 10 or higher, he hits her. There's a 12, so he pushes her. Let's see if she loses her balance. Let's have her do a modified dexterity check. Her dexterity is 17. If she rolls 17 or less, she does. So she maintains her balance and maintains her composure, but she's, he's pushed her off balance, and he runs and flees off the scene. So he's taken off. This guy's going to get struck from behind by the other characters that followed him. So she could have saved the day there, but she's dropped the ball on that one. So let's do Zalrus first. Zalrus can only miss on a 1. Okay. And let's turn this up a little bit in the background so you can hear it better. All right, can only miss on a one, and he rolls a one. So he's in the front line. He has his pole arm and his glaive. He tries to jam this guy in the back, and he completely misses. And because he's right-handed, I'm going to say that he jams his pole arm. It's stuck in the side of the of the wood, which cuts off Renjar, and Renjar can't make his attack. So he blocks Renjar off from doing his attack. That means Mercedes behind. This guy gets to take one, two, three, and steps, and he's going to flee, and he's gone. So we're in a bad position now. This is not good. Um, <laughs> I know what's in this next room. I don't have a map for the next room. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to have those two frost giants haul butt. I'm going to have the party get back together and pull back. And then say Mercedes, say pull back, pull back. Um, Obscura is going to run over to here. So Elephanisi runs and gets on this side. Vendor's like, pull back, pull back. Let's bring him to this room. So let's do it this way. Because they're getting pulled too far. It's not because I don't have the map. Because they're getting pulled too far into the into the dungeon. So here's what we're going to do. Elephanisi and Vrindra are both going to return to Hiding in Shadows. Let's get those rolls done first. Let's pick the spot where they're going to do it. So the first thing they're going to do is uh, let's get this torch here snuffed out and this torch here snuffed out. So these are snuffed. And Vrindra and Mercedes are going to come over here and hide in shadows. And it shouldn't be too hard for them to do that. Where's our percentage die? Let's do the purple one. Let's do uh, let's do Elephanisi, not Mercedes. I keep calling her Mercedes by mistake. Let's do Elephanisi first. Her hiding shadows is 68 percent, 62 barely makes it, and she's not moving. She doesn't really need to move, move silently roll. And let's do Vrinjar's. His that's a 14. So he, these two are completely concealed. In fact, we'll just put these mar blue markers. We should make some cool stealth markers. So these two are hidden in shadows by these crates in this dark corner here, and this torch here because they snuff this torch out here. It's complete darkness. It's complete darkness. This is the only light source. This is a light source. So in terms of lighting, you have this is the light happening from that torch this is the light happening from this torch and then you have these have all got snuffed so the only light is really in this area here this is the only light happening all this other stuff is in shadows now there's two torches here so this one's illuminating the gate so other positioning um, the druid's going to come down to here, and she's actually going to duck around the corner and hide behind this wall here. Obscura's going to come back to here and get back behind this pillar. The cleric's going to backtrack to this area and say, come to me for heals. 
We're going to have Mercedes move back to here and Zollers move back to heel, to here, excuse me. And I'm going to actually get some uh, 48 heals going off here on the damaged people. So let's get some more eight siders. This is a 10. Where all my eight siders go? Have I lost them all? Let's do it this way. There's the third one. And we're missing one. I need a red one. Where's the red eight sider? Okay, we'll just do it. Here's the blue one. Okay, so um, the cleric is going to do a two heals, one on uh, Mercedes, one on Zalaris. So we're gonna put them in position like this over here by the water. Pull back over this, and uh, we're gonna do four d8 uh, heal, which is essentially him casting um, cure critical wounds type situation. So cure serious wounds. So. Um, by the way, my heal spells are different than the first edition. I basically just give you a D, a 2d8 for each one. And I add additional 2d8 by level. So we got 8 and 8 is 16. There's 24 and 25. So 25 added back to Mercedes. Let's see, where's her health number at? Here we are. We're over here. So she was at 101. She gets 25. That puts her at 126. And then he's going to do the same thing and turn and do the same thing for Zaz. Give him a critical heal too. 48. 7 7 is 14, plus 4 is 18, plus 1 is 19. So 19 plus the 95. Let's just add that together real quick. That puts him at 114. That's okay, not great. Still okay, but not great. 114, 126. They can't camp because there's actively uh, stuff going on. So here's a real problem. This would be really nasty. They can hear. I'm going to do a hear noise check for Vrinjar. The Druid's like, can you tell what's going on? Obscura comes over to here. These guys get the heels off. Vrindra's going to sneak down to here and see if he can hear anything. Elephanisi's going to stay hot on his heels, and the Druid's going to hide over here and stay here behind the, the line of sight. So let's do a hear noise check. Now, if they make a successful hear noise check, they can tell what's going on. Obscura has a sword that speaks giant. She's going to pull the sword out and hold it in her hand. That'll help her interpret what's being said. So she's going to come down to here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And we'll see whether the sword hears anything. So the first thing we're going to do is do a hear noise check for uh, Vrinjar. <clears throat> and basically what we're checking to see here is can he tell the gist of what's being yelled and screamed down the hallway because it sounds like verbal alarms have been raised. So for him to hear noise is 35% chance. He needs to roll 35% or less than percent all dots to understand what's going on. A 10, that's fantastic. So he can tell what's going on. Let's give uh, Elephanisi, that's a 002. She can tell what's going on. Um, they are able to determine that the uh, a number of guards down the end of the corridor have been alerted. They've given verbal descriptions of the armed warriors and the humans that have come and attacked and how you know this guy's name and this guy's names were killed very easily. And they're like, get the rest of the guards, meet me at the gate. So it sounds like a lot's coming towards the gate. So the druids say, what are they saying? What are they saying? It's, it sounds like they're going to rush the gate or something. They don't speak giant. Um, Obscura says, they're coming to the gate. They're coming to the gate. So the druids are going to zip around this way, and they're going to get back into position here. And they're going to slide back over here, get behind these shadows behind here. And Obscura is like, listen, um, she runs back over here and tells everyone else what's going on. Listen, they're, they're coming with lots of guards. Maybe 10 giants are coming down the hallway. They're going to come for the gate. Should we try to bar the gate? What would Mercedes do? That's a good chance for you to decide. So we'll stop the episode right there. This is the tactical situation. I'll take a picture of it with my phone. Um, what you need to do now, you need to decide what the party's going to do. Are they going to try to bar the gate and defend from here and make the giants bash down the gate? Or are they going to try to move forward? What are they gonna, what, what's the deal? What are they going to do? Let's just move this over here a little bit like this. So here's the situation. Let's just put it this way. Let's say that there's 10 to 18 giants come whipping down the hallway, okay? So with that in mind, this is the decision you have to make. I'm going to give you option number one. Option number one is bar the gate. We'll just say bar, which is when I talk about the gate, we're talking about this right here. This huge wood gate, which means taking a dagger or sword and driving in with a hammer or something, try to lock the gate. Now these guys are frost giants. They're going to have a lot of strength. They're probably able to bash that down. But when that's happening, it buys you enough time to see how many, how many can get up behind this wall before they start attacking. Um, that's option number one. Option number two is use an illusion of, of something powerful 
in this area to make them flee. Like she could summon some kind of illusion of a drow priestess you know, with an army of guards with her and they might think the drow are coming to attack. Um, option number three is back pedal, back step. Now back step means move out of this room into another room and channel them to coming in to fight because this room has got lots of sneaky quarters. It's actually a very good tactical room. And option number four is stand your ground. All right. Option number one, bar the gate. Option number two, use an illusion. And the illusion is to get them to not come to the gate. Option number three is leave the room. And option number four is stand your ground and fight in this room. So you can go to the Patreon page and vote for that. I'll post that up probably later tonight when the video goes up. And in a couple days, you get to vote to see what happens next. Let's get a picture of where everyone is so everyone knows what's going on. And I hope you had fun with this episode. I'd like to hear feedback of whether you like the audio or not. So if you get a chance, um, let's put this like this. There we go. If you get a chance, uh, give me a YouTube comment and say, yo, the audio is pretty cool or it's too loud or I don't like it or, it's, or whatever. If you like that kind of stuff, I think it's kind of neat. If you don't like it, that's fine. I'll turn it off. It doesn't bother me any. Um, if you like having these kind of choices at the end of the episodes, let me know if you want to do that stuff too. Remember, you don't need to be a patron paying any money or anything to do that. That's just, just for people who want to contribute and help fund the show so I can buy more stuff. Um, so if you want to make a vote on that, all you need to have is a Patreon account for free. Um, definitely share and like and subscribe to the video so you get alerts when I make the next episode. Because if you don't watch out, don't have a subscription, you can't tell when the next one's coming out. And if you have a Patreon and you follow me on Patreon, you can find out when the actual poll ends or when the next episode's going to happen with the result of the poll. All right? Hope you had fun. Long episode. Lots of fighting. Lots of cool nasty bits. There was a good decapitation happened here of Rinjar. And we're going to leave it at that. And we'll talk to you again next time. Once again, this is Classic DM. This is, uh, what is it, Season 2, Episode 8, The Horn. So the horn never got blown. Too bad, guys. We'll talk to you later. Have a great evening and a great Veterans Day.